In this video, I will present a second example of how to prove that a function has a limit directly from the definition of limit. In the previous video, in example one, I chose a function that was simple, so I could focus on understanding the logic and structure of the proof. In example two, the function will be more complicated, so the math will be harder, but the structure of the proof is the same. It is important that you have watched and understood example one before trying to tackle example two. I will put a link in the description of the video. Here is the problem. I want to prove that the limit as x approaches 4 of x squared plus 1 is 17, and I want to do it directly from the definition of limit. So let's recall the definition of limit. What I need to show is that for every epsilon positive, there exists a delta positive such that if the distance between x and 4 is between 0 and delta, then the distance between x squared plus 1 and 17 is smaller than epsilon. The statement I want to prove is very similar to the same statement in, in example 1. So the structure of the proof will also be the same. Let's quickly recall the structure. In my proof, I'm going to need to first fix an arbitrary value of epsilon. After I do that, I will say what I take as delta, and delta may be a function of epsilon. And after that, I will assume the hypothesis in the conditional. I fix an arbitrary real number, and I assume the distance between x and 4 is between 0 and delta. And after doing some math, hopefully I can conclude that the distance between x squared plus 1 and 17 is smaller than epsilon. Like before, the most difficult step is to decide what I take as delta. So before I start writing the proof, I can't quite do that yet, Let's do some rough work to see if we can come up with a good expression for delta. I'll focus for now on the implication. I want to end up concluding that the distance between x squared plus 1 and 17 is smaller than epsilon. Being with some algebra, I can rewrite this distance as the absolute value of x squared minus 16, these factors as the absolute value of x plus 4 and the absolute value of x minus 4. And in the middle of the proof, I will be assuming the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta, so the product is less than delta times the absolute value of x plus 4. Now, I want to conclude the left-hand side is smaller than epsilon, and I know it's smaller than delta times the absolute value of x plus 4. So perhaps I may be tempted to take delta as epsilon over the absolute value of x plus 4. This is a bad idea. This doesn't work. This is very wrong. But I'm mentioning it because this is a common error that I have seen often in students' papers, so I want to explain why it's a bad idea. Let's take a step back and let's look back at the structure of the proof. We were supposed to first fix epsilon, then say what we take as delta as a function of epsilon, then fix a generic x, assume the hypothesis, etc. Notice that delta is allowed to depend on epsilon, but not on x. In fact, it makes no sense to allow delta to depend on x. If you think about it a bit further, you will notice that if we allow delta to depend on x, we change the meaning entirely. This doesn't mean limit. So delta can only depend on epsilon. So that idea didn't work, and I seem to be a bit stuck. There are two tricks that can help me at the moment. First, since the part that bothers me is the absolute value of x plus 4, if I can somehow manage to prove that the absolute value of x plus 4 is less than some constant c. For example, if I can prove the absolute value of x plus 4 is less than 100 by any means, then by taking delta as epsilon over 100, I think I'll be able to finish the proof. So I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know yet if I can do this. But if I can prove that the absolute value of x plus 4 is bounded by a constant, then I have a way to finish the proof. Is this reasonable? Yes, it is. Since delta is small, x is going to be close to 4, and if x is close to 4, the absolute value of x plus 4 cannot be arbitrarily large. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be smaller than 100, but I have to prove it. So here comes the second trick. The second trick is that I am going to choose delta at most 1, because that will guarantee that x and 4 are close. There are two important remarks to make here. First, I am allowed to do this. Remember that in the proof, I get to choose delta. I have to say what I'm taking as delta. So I can put constraints on delta. I'm just going to keep track of all the conditions I would need delta to satisfy. And at the end, if I can find one delta with all those conditions, that's the one I will take, and the proof will work. So it is OK for me to put extra constraints on delta. 
as long as I check at the end that there is such a delta. Second, I've put here one for simplicity, but it's an arbitrary choice. I could have chosen any other number, and this could lead to another proof that also works. It looks different, but also works. I just kept it as one for simplicity. So with those two remarks, how does it help me to choose delta at most one? If I do that, the absolute value of x minus four, which is less than delta, will also be less than one. And therefore, x will be between three and five, x plus four will be between seven and nine, and therefore the absolute value of x plus four will be less than nine. Hooray, that's what I needed. Choosing delta at most one guarantees that I can bound the absolute value of x plus four by nine. And therefore I only need to take delta at most epsilon over nine, and that will make the proof work. So I need two conditions. I need a delta that is at most one and that is at most epsilon over nine. The easiest way to accomplish that is by choosing delta to be the smallest of those two numbers, whichever one is smallest. That will be a positive number that satisfies both inequalities. So I've done it, I found a value of delta that works. That means I am ready to write the proof. Remember that what I've done so far does not count as a proof. I haven't even begun the proof. I now need to write the proof properly in the logical order, making sure that every step does follow from the previous ones and that I haven't confused myself doing the rough work. So let's do that. To prove this claim, first I fix an arbitrary positive epsilon, then I take delta to be the minimum of one and epsilon over nine. How do I know this? Because of all the rough work I did in the previous slide, otherwise I couldn't know it. Choosing this delta guarantees the delta is less than or equal than 1 and also less than or equal than epsilon over 9. Next, I fix an arbitrary real number x and I assume the distance between x and 4 is between 0 and delta. This implies that this distance is less than epsilon over 9 and also less than 1. Since it is less than 1, x must be between 3 and 5 and therefore x plus 4 must be between 7 and 9. And now, Let's take the expression I care about. The absolute value of x squared plus one minus 17 is the absolute value of x squared minus 16. It factors as the absolute value of x minus four and the absolute value of x plus four. The first term is less than epsilon over nine and the second term is less than nine. So the product is at most epsilon. And that's it. I have proven that the distance between x squared plus one and 17 is smaller than epsilon as needed. So this completes the proof. To conclude, I want to repeat that the proof is just this slide by itself. I could have skipped everything else and just written this, and that could be enough. But of course, if I had done that, you could have asked me, how did you think of choosing this value of delta? Yes, this proof explains why this value of delta works, but how did you come up with it? And the reality is that I do have to do the rough work, even if I'd only do it in my head or I hide it somewhere. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to write the proof. But the proof is just this, and notice that in the proof, everything has to be in the right order and every step must follow logically from the previous ones. So I do need to fix epsilon before I say what I take as delta, as a function of epsilon. And for example, every time I use a property of x, that property has to be established beforehand. So every step follows logically from the previous ones.